Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Did you all see that beautiful video that just aired reflecting on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Please tell me you did. Thank you. That was my nice way of saying, no, y'all didn't. Y'all was talking still. Y'all didn't see it, but that's okay. We're going to rerun it at the end of the show. If you can kindly make your way to your table, your seat. It is so good to see all my friends, family. I think y'all are my friends and family. I see lots of familiar faces here. But we do want to get this program started. So again, if you could kindly make your way to your seats, that would be amazing. The mayor has a busy schedule today. Ask me how I know because I talked about it all morning on the news, because we have a winter storm, so he has somewhere to be, so we're gonna get this thing started. Good morning, an official, official welcome. I am Val Warner from ABC7. I wanna thank you all so much for making ABC7 the number one station in this market. We do not take for granted your support, your viewership. Shout out to my president and general manager, John Eitler, and Deanna Palomar, our vice president of community engagement, who are here with me. And my general manager is also talking to a man I would be remiss if we did not acknowledge to stand on our feet. Of course, Reverend Jesse Jackson in the building. Come on, y'all, let's show him some love, some respect some honor, Reverend, love you. Thank you so much for being, uh-oh, can I throw up the hooks? Are you, if the Reverend gives me the permission, how many cues I have in the house? The, the, the hooks get like that when you get to your age and that's just perfectly fine. You throw them up however you choose, Reverend Jackson. That's what I'm talking about. And he gave me permission, rude to the bruhs. Uh oh, I'm gonna have the Kappas mad at me, and the Sigmas. I know. I love the whole D9. I love you all, okay? But again, what an honor and a privilege to be here to serve and navigate this program, this beautifully spelled out program, as we celebrate the 38th annual interfaith breakfast to remember and celebrate the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We would like to begin this morning's program. Of course, by asking everyone to rise and join us as we sing, Lift Every Voice and Sing. This is going to be led by Kevin C. Montfort, Jr. and the Tribe of Favored. Everybody, please, to their feet, please stand. Lift every voice and sing till earth in heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Yet with a 
posterity be have not our weary feet come to the place for which our Father Kevin C. Montfort Jr. and thank you all for sharing in that rendition together. We would like to begin the program by thanking all of the elected officials who are joining us today. Let's give them a round of applause. If you don't mind standing, please stand. We'd like to acknowledge you and thank you for your service. And also our keynote speaker today, the Honorable Judge Greg Mathis. Good to see you and to have you here with us. Looking forward to your comments. And this breakfast would not be possible if it were not for the generous support of plenty of partners who are here today. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize. So the presenting sponsors, and it's OK to clap your hands and show some love to Allstate, Amazon, Ferrara, Globe Trotters Engineering Corporation, McDonald's, People's Gas. Oh, McDonald's, okay. Y'all let McDonald's show you up. Walgreens, are you here? Okay, now we're talking. And then our partners, United Airlines and US Bank, thank you. And also to our supporters, ComEd, Northern Trust, Walmart Incorporated, BOA Construction, and the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. Let's give them all a round of applause. At this point, I'd like to give a special thank you to our mayor, Mayor Brandon Johnson, for bringing us together for this beautiful occasion to honor the legacy of Dr. King. Each year, we celebrate his vision of solidarity and his belief that all faiths contribute to building a better community. So, uh -uh, I know I don't hear those forks. Did y'all bless that food? I don't know, Mayor, you know as a, it, did you know I was a PK? Oh, you didn't know that, uh-huh. As a PK, they, they're not supposed to eat without blessing that food, right? Okay, so put the forks down for two seconds. Please join me in welcoming Billy Evans. He is the Chief of Faith Engagement for the City of Chicago to give the invocation. Can we pause for one second to invoke God's presence? Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. We come this morning to invoke your presence in the midst of this gathering. We realize we can do nothing without you, and so we ask that you would be the honored guest today as we reflect on the life and the legacy of Dr. King. May we never forget his labor and his leadership during turbulent times and the grace you gave him to change our world. Father, we thank you for our mayor, Brandon Johnson. We ask that you bless him as he leads our city during chaotic times. We pray that you give him the strategy, the courage, and the wisdom to guide our city into the future. We pray also for his family, that you would cover and bless them. Now, Father, we thank you for every person in this place, whether they be faith leaders, elected officials, or union leaders. We ask that you would help us to live together and work together as brothers and sisters to form a more perfect city. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray and bless our food Amen and amen. All 
righty. Okay, so let's see. I Six. As you enjoy breakfast this morning, we are going to have another special performance and selection. Once again, we want to welcome Kevin C. Montfort Jr. and the Tribe of Favor. Take it away.
you so much for that fantastic performance. And ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to introduce our host for today and the mayor of the best city in the world, the city of Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Brandon Johnson. Well, good morning. Thank you so much, Val Warner. How about that? Val Warner has been up since yesterday, y'all. She looks great. She's doing her part. We appreciate her leadership, but I do want to welcome all of you today. Of course, the fantastic presentation of this amazing choir. Thank you uh, for honoring the presence of God. In the city of Chicago, I know we have some out-of-towners here, but this is the most sanctified city in the entire world. But again, as we are here to celebrate Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his life and his legacy, and all of those who follow in his footsteps, it is truly a privilege to help live out and fulfill that legacy. Dr. King's life's work represented a steadfast commitment to ensuring and advancing equality for everyone. As a true man of vision, he challenged Americans to fully embrace the core values of our nation's constitution, of freedom, liberty, and justice. He worked tirelessly to awaken the consciousness of the globe. The City of Chicago Champion of Freedom Award recognizes and honors Chicagoans who have embraced those very principles. Individuals that carry out and carry on in the spirit of our true leader. And this year's champion of Freedom Award, someone who has imbibed the true spirit and essence of what it means to have faith alongside of work. Because I'm reminded of a scripture that if you don't have faith and work, you sleep. And this brother is, is fully woke. So this year's Champion of Freedom Award is presented to Elder Romel Ferguson. The Operations Manager for the Chicago Teachers Union and is a minister at the Divine Tree of Life Missionary Baptist Church, though he's got a little bit of Kojic in him. A proud product of Chicago Public Schools, Elder Ferguson has been a dedicated individual He's been dedicated to empowering his community throughout his entire life. In addition to leading events and programming for the Chicago Teachers Union, he uplifts and inspires those around him through faith, service, and educational advocacy. It is truly my honor to pay tribute to a West Sider, Elder Romel Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor Johnson. And we give a round of applause for the First Lady of the City of Chicago, none other than Miss Stacy Johnson. <laughs> to my mother, a portion of my aunts that are here with me, to my CTU family, our president, Stacy Davis Gates, Jackson Potter, Christelle William Hayes, and Miss Maria Moreno. Good morning, Chicago. Good morning, Chicago. Good morning. And we really knew it was Chicago this morning, didn't we? It is truly an honor to receive this Champion of Freedom Award. I am grateful for the opportunity to address you all today. This recognition is not just a personal achievement, but is a testament of power and collaboration between faith and labor in pursuing justice and equality. As a faith and labor leader and a proud staff member of the Chicago Teachers Union, I embody faith and labor. I am reminded of the wisdom that is find in, found in the book of Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter, round about the ninth verse. It says that two are better than one because if one of them 
have good return on their labor. Or if either one of them which was to fall, one could help the other. So with us being in this room representing faith and labor, we have the ability to accomplish some of the greatest things in which can be imagined. Dr. King had a dream, but we're not dreaming anymore. We're in the, in the moment where we are in the place of manifestation and accomplishing the thing in which that he have dreamed and many of you may have dreamed and imagined. You know, we have seen some things throughout our lifetime. In 2004, when I was going to high school, they closed our neighborhood high school. And you'd have thought that they'd have learned from that when the students from the west side had to go to Clemente and to Wells High School. And then so you had the students fighting. Then we showed up in 2013, they closed 50 more schools. But if we come to the realization that funding schools is the answer. And I thank God for the initiative of bringing Chicago home. You can clap. But homelessness is not a moral or a personal failure, but it is a structural and a political failure. And it's our job and it's our opportunity as the faith and the labor community, the business community, that we can come together to assure that people are not live out in the streets for they're unhoused. None of us don't know what it's like, but we have the ability to make that change. Thank you to the city council that voted to bring Chicago home. And now it's upon us as the citizens of this great city to make sure that we bring Chicago home. And we're reminded that faith without works is dead. So there's work that we all must do, and we can do it step by step. And I want you to know that don't get weary in well-doing, because you're going to face some obstacles. But I'm rested assured in the book of Exodus, the Lord told Moses, he said that I've seen the afflictions of my people, and I've heard their cries, and i come down to deliver them. The Lord has seen the afflictions, and he has heard the cries. That scripture transcends generations. It was spoken to them, but it still exists to us. Thank you, Chicago. Thank you, Mayor Brandon Johnson. God bless you all, and remember that we must do this thing together. God bless you. Let's give Elder Ferguson another round of applause. Congratulations. Well-deserved, well-honored, and of course, a huge thank you to Mayor Brandon Johnson. And at this point, we'd like to welcome our unity prayer leaders to the stage for this morning's event. Reverend Beth Brown will be representing Lincoln Park Presbyterian Church. Six Ward Alderman William Hall will also be saying a prayer. And Rabbi Shoshana Conover will be representing Temple Shalom. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. You made it. Way to go. True Chicagoans. Before I begin, I want you to know that I am the leader of the Faith Community Initiative. So all of you faith community leaders out there, if you want to be a part of housing, supporting, and accompanying migrants in our city, please talk to me after our breakfast this morning. And now, let us join our hearts together in prayer. God of many names, we are gathered here today in this place in the midst of a real storm to celebrate Dr. King's vision and work and to pray for unity. Unity begins with understanding every one of us was made in your image and you call us beloved. Those who do not want us to live into our greatness, let alone our power, would have us believe unity is sameness, or at least agreement on matters of moral purity because they know we will get stuck there when we don't and won't agree. Those who do not want us to organize, work together, and build power want us to believe that resources and money are scarce and we have to fight each other over the scraps from the table. Those who do not want us to have the power to create the change we see and seek want us to believe that if we need something, the best way to get it is to curry favor with those who hold elected power 
and to be seated at all the right tables or to cancel them all. Those who do not want us to challenge their power want us to believe that having a vision for our own church or mosque or temple and building bigger buildings is where our focus needs to be and end. Remind us that Dr. King did not bring people together so they could feel good about being unified. Dr. King organized people and communities in order to build power so that there was enough power to turn the world upside down. What unifies us today as faith leaders in the city of Chicago is that we are living in a world that is not the way we want it to be. God, who holds the worlds in your hands, you have given us vision through all of the prophets and ancestors for a world in which justice and love go hand in hand. Supremacies are dismantled. Power is from the community and for the community with the community. Poverty is eliminated. Occupation and colonization are ended. Every immigrant is welcomed. Health and mental health quick care and equitable education are accessible to all. Children and widows are cared for. Gun violence and violence and militarization are eliminated. We prioritize our planet's well-being. Justice is restorative rather than punitive. Resources are shared through reparations rather than hoarded. And love overcomes all forms of hatred. All of us here this morning want to live in that world. Xavier Ramey reminds us that if we are to create the world we want to live in, we have to reconstitute our social contract with one another. A contract that says we will keep one another safe and care for each other's children. This is not a contract we hand over to those we elect. This is our contract given by you to love one another in real time and real life and real actions. As we begin a new year, we claim what we know to be true. We are enough and we have enough, which means not taking more than we need for our daily bread. In every neighborhood and ward, we have people with the gifts we need to bring us together in power. Across this city from the south to the north and from the west to the east, we have an abundance of wealth, knowledge, talent, creativity, persistence, understanding, generosity, and compassion. What keeps us from building and walking the road to power through unity is that we have let our differences desecrate our social contract. Wake us up. Deepen in all of us the call and commitment to come together to create a Chicago where there is room enough for everyone as we bring Chicago home and continue our legacy as a sanctuary city. Where there is food enough for everyone, voice enough for everyone, resources enough for everyone, opportunities enough for everyone, work permits enough for everyone. You did not call us to a spirit of timidity, but to a spirit of power with love. Give us the courage to work together to create change, to work with and hold accountable the mayor and city council to your vision, and to build each other up in this holy work. In the name of the one who was love incarnate, amen. Let's bow our heads again. God, first of all, we say thank you. God, we thank you that you gave us the strength to get up this morning. But God, somebody didn't. And so God, we ask that you wrap your arms around someone with tears in this city. And so God, we come to this moment asking that you give us the strength to love each other. God, may this be the year that we love and not be petty. May this be the year that we look out for each other and not turn away from each other. May this be the year, dear God, that we sit together, laugh together, and love together. And so God bless our mayor, give him the strength to bring us together, the north, the south, the east, and the west. God give him the strength in those trying times, dear God, to give us the truth that we need to hear. But God give us the penmanship and the pens to write the policies that's pleasing in your sight. And so God, for those who are not here today that are not at our tables, give us the strength to bring them to the table. 
We thank you for those who have given so much and sacrificed so much. And God, give us the grace to keep on going. And so, God, if you can give us the strength to get through this storm, give us the strength to get through the storms ahead. And so, God, there's nothing too hard for you. There's nothing that you failed at. And so, God, we speak victory in Chicago. We speak a victory that can be heard across this country. And so when people ask, how did we do it? We'll give you the praise. When people ask, why did we do it? We'll give you the praise. And so, God, we thank you for all of the new policies that are for your people. And so, God, give us the strength to fight for the poor. Give us the strength to eradicate poverty. But most of all, give us the strength to care for those who we see. And so may this be the year that we make new friends. May this be the year of new bridges. And most of all, may this be the year that we always remember that you matter. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. So I got shortened time, which is great because we all want to hear from our mayor. So let me just, before I begin, let me just ask this question. When is the last time you cried? But what I mean is when you really wept over how broken our world is right now. When's the last time you asked someone near you what breaks their heart and then listened as they wept? I know it's tough and vulnerable to share our brokenheartedness, but my God, who is not brokenhearted right now? And so a great Jewish teaching says we cannot truly know another person until we know what breaks their heart. And we truly should understand how we can be united in our grief because we really know each other. How sad is it that so many faith leaders, we do not know each other yet. What breaks your heart? What do you need to share? And what do you need to hear from others in order to do this holy work? The mayor is counting on us to unify together, to get ourselves together, even if it starts with just sharing our brokenheartedness and then getting to work. Are we following the sad truth that hurt people hurt people? Or are we following Dr. King's demand of us to see that there is a tension in all of our hearts between good and evil and recognize that sometimes our hearts aren't right, that our neighbors' hearts aren't right, that our fellow pastors, monks, imams, priests, rabbis, nuns' hearts are not right, and then notice that we must work together to fix those broken hearts, to fix our world. We're all like David, Dr. King preached one month before his death, who wanted to build a temple for God in Jerusalem. It was in his heart, but of course, his dreams, David's dreams went unfulfilled. But Dr. King said, so many of us in life start out building temples, temples of characters, temples of justice, temples of peace, and so often we cannot finish them. One of the agonies of life is that we are constantly trying to finish something that is unfinishable, finishable, but we are commanded to do just that, to start to dream to care. Life is long, and we are commanded to have in our hearts, our broken hearts, a vision of a better world, a better city, and we must then respond by getting to know each other, working with one another, and being able to say we are ready to do this holy work. When Moses was called on by God from the burning bush, God didn't choose Moses because he was perfect, he was not. Moses was afraid and lost and couldn't articulate well what was in his heart, and he didn't hide it, he wept to God. And at that bush, God listened and assured Moses that he would not have to do anything alone. God was with him. Other faith leaders were with him. Aaron was with him. Miriam was with him. And God didn't choose a grand place from which to call on Moses, not a palace or even a mountaintop. God, God called from a lowly shrub out in the wilderness. That bush was on fire. This world is on fire. Our city is on fire, even through this snow. And our broken hearts are aflame with a fire that is, is inextinguishable, fire that has the power to destroy, but the power to build, the power to respond as Moses did when he heard God's call, Hineni, here I am, so I pray. 
Let us hear your voice, O oh God, calling us today from a world on fire. Lead us to right action that begins with right listening. Show us how to be there, God, for each other so this city can depend on its faith community. Because we know each other, we love each other, we take heed and tend to each other's hearts, listening, loving, supporting one another. Because we know, God, that if we do not know how to do this for each other, if we do not take time to do this for each other, how can we expect anyone else in our city to do this for one another? How can they unify if we do not? Please, God, let us be your messengers, your messengers in healing the brokenhearted, starting today with one another. And please, God, we pray, let us continue to respond to your call to be holy support that this mayor needs to bring healing to our great city in this brokenhearted time. And to that, I invite us to say amen. Thank you. At this point, we are in for a real treat. Please join me in welcoming the Grammy award-winning gospel artist, Smokey Norfolk. Uh, to Mayor Johnson, to First Lady Johnson, uh, Reverend Jackson, so great to see you. Um, and to all of God's beautiful people in the city of Chicago on this snowy morning greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior. I bless you uh, with the faith of our Father, with the favor of our Father. I believe that God is already doing extraordinary things and that in spite of everything that we've suffered through, everything that we've endured, everything that we've seen in the last five years, I'm still grateful today to be able to stand here and tell God, thank you. Thank you in spite of thank you in the midst of and thank you because of I thank you for my life it feels so good to make it this far and I didn't think I could take it so long oh, and the moments I thought I'd fail I was reminded of of his nails so I held on wasn't always easy but I held on and if I never live to see to see another day there's nothing I would change or take away hey, I've had so many ups that they far outweigh my downs Lord, I thank you Thank you for For my life For my life Lord, I thank you I could have been One of the ones who lost my way There were times, times in my life, I almost went crazy. Hey, but I'm still here. Yes, I'm here with my, with my life. Now it may not be everything, everything I'd hoped for. And every dream has not yet been realized hey, But to see his face, to stand and look at him face to face one day This is all gonna be worth it Yeah, yeah, Lord, I thank you for every door you've opened every way how you kept me when I couldn't keep myself Lord, I thank you Yeah Lord, I, I, I just want to take the time to 
just say thank you Jesus thank you for Lord I thank you Lord I thank you for all you've done in our lives Lord we thank you cause you've been better than we've deserved Lord we thank you yeah, Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we, we thank you. You've been so good. And Lord, we thank, we thank you. Hey, Lord, we, we thank you. And because you've been this good, Lord, we praise you. We give you all the honor, all the glory. We praise you. Hey, Lord, we praise you. Yeah, you're so good. And Lord, we praise you. And because you're worthy of it, we shout hallelujah. You're an awesome God. You're a magnificent God. So worthy of the honor, hallelujah. hallelujah. For the rest of my days, I'll give your name praise and say hallelujah. y'all went to church today or I should speak for myself I went to church today all right Smokey Norfolk thank you so much for blessing us with that thank you for being in snowy Chicago <laughs> we really appreciate that um, we are honored to welcome our keynote speaker the honorable judge Greg Mathis judge Mathis is the longest running African-American male host on television with his show now in its 24th season. I think that deserves a round of applause, 24 seasons. His inspirational life story of going from a justice involved youth to a judge has provided hope for the millions of folks who watch his Emmy award-winning television court show, Judge Mathis, each day. Judge Mathis reaches out to youth and ex-offenders both in and outside of the courtroom. He opened the Mathis Community Center in his hometown of Detroit in 2021 and has assisted thousands of youths with his nonprofit agency, Young Adults Asserting Themselves. Judge Mathis is a champion of young people and justice-involved individuals, helping them to succeed and contribute to their communities. Please help me welcome to the stage Judge Mathis. Thank you, Sister Cheryl, Sister Val. Sister Cheryl usually hosting. Got to give her a break today. That's right. Bring Val Warner out. Val prettied up my background. She said, "A justice involved youth to a judge." I think she meant, or she should have been real with it, and said, "A young man that went from jail." to judge. Don't be afraid to say jail. Half y'all in here been to jail. And it ain't for civil rights. For drunk driving. Picking up that woman you shouldn't have picked up. <laughs> don't invite the judge here if you don't want it real. And the biggest part that Val did not mention and had no reason to know that most of you do know is I could never thank Reverend Jackson enough for what he's done to my life. He is perhaps along with my family the most responsible for my success and for me going from jail to judge. It was in that jail that I met Reverend Jackson. 
when he was doing his I am somebody. And see, you all, that's why you have always supported Rainbow Push. This is the work he's done. I told him after he spoke to the group that I wanted to help him fight white people. That's how I put it. I didn't know how to say it. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that equal justice, social justice, equality, those are the things. I, but I'm from the projects in jail. All I know is I love what the man's saying, and he has broken down my circumstance, so now I know what to leave here and do. When I told him I wanted to fight, he said, you don't have any weapons. He said, you go to college, you get out of here, go to college, come back, then you can work for me. As God would have it, I went to college based on his inspiration after getting my GED. When I came back from college, he happened to be organizing a campaign, his first 1984 campaign. And I went to the organizing meeting, walked up. I said, Reverend, I'm the young man I met you in jail. You told me if I went to college, I can come back and work with you. Just got my degree. What we going to do? And he has mentored me all the way through politics all of that time through the city of Detroit. And I could never thank you enough, Rev. Never thank you enough. And certainly, I want to thank the most popular mayor in Chicago. And I'm not being funny. Anybody can get all these folks out in the temperature in a blizzard. He's popular, y'all. And his staff told me to cut it short, so let me go. But I don't know why they would tell me that. I didn't come from sunny California to a blizzard. And you tell me, cut it short, Judge. Cut you short, I'm going to cut you up. You keep on. Y'all know that's what I've done for 24 years that I've taped here. I cut you up if you're not right. And let me thank once again the mayor for all that he is doing. And you know, I've supported him from the beginning and will continue to support him because we should appreciate his leadership, his fearless leadership, and his commitment toward policies that uplift all of Chicago residents. In a way, Dr. King would certainly be proud. He has appointed an administration that is the most diverse in Chicago history. But not only has he appointed police chiefs and others, he's appointed, appointed more than just black faces in high places. His focus has been on places such as Inglewood, Today we see him surrounded not by corporate America, not by city council, not by county commission, not by the governor. We see him surrounded by educators who will prepare our young people for the workplace. So his work throughout Chicago should be applauded and appreciate it. He's fighting to bring Chicago home. A referendum that will reduce the taxes for 93% of Chicagoans. Reduce the taxes. Now some of us are gonna have to pay a little more. I don't mind paying more because it's gonna help the folks that need the help. And yes, I pay taxes here. I've worked here 24 years. I've paid millions upon millions of taxes, y'all. That's why I'm going to be able to whoop up on a couple of folks in here. Because I pay taxes just like you. Many of y'all much, much more. Many of you hoity-toity types. I still pay more than you. Many of you corporate leaders in here trying to run out of town. Well, I pay more than you. If I can stay in town, you can stay in town. I don't even tape here no more. And I'm keeping my place. But let me leave that alone. I don't want to get in trouble. But I do want to bring awareness to the multiple crisis that we're facing here 
in Chicago. And I want to give a little advice on how we can avoid Chicago becoming Detroit, where I'm from. We have a crisis, the migrant crisis, that has been thrown in his lap by quarreling governmental bodies outside of Chicago. Mayor Texas, don't have, he don't have a beef with Chicago. His beef is with the federal government. He just know we had a humane mayor. He could practice his inhumanity on and brought him here. And why? In defiance of the federal policies. His beef is with the federal government. We're just suckers in the middle. And if you don't understand that, then you're going to be one of the suckers that's blaming him for something that is he's a victim of. He's a victim of the governor of Texas. He's a victim of the federal government and a Congress that will not fund this crisis that we're in. Got hit us turning on him. Got us turning on each other. How often? I watch the news here. Even when I'm in Los Angeles, I have my Chicago news. I read it and watch it. I never hear him talking about, never hear him talking about the Congress and the Senate not getting the funding to finance the migrant crisis, which indeed is their responsibility. It's the federal government's responsibility. We don't hear that. We hear Mayor Brandon Johnson. He's not doing for the migrant crisis. He's not doing that. That's not his responsibility. He's in Washington practically and literally begging for money, asking for $5 billion. They looked at him like he was a fool and gave him a, oh, y'all too sophisticated for me to say, <laughs> about the piss in the window to throw it out. That's an old time reference for black folks. But that's, those are the leaders that need to be held accountable. They're playing games with each other while we have over 20,000 immigrants being dumped on our streets without any care. Don't you blame him. If you're going to organize and blame and point fingers, point it at Washington, D.C. and down to Texas. <laughs> then he has to address the entrenched poverty that we see, which is caused by economic deprivation and economic abandonment and it is unfortunate that we hear so much about this there appears to be many of our leaders not appears indeed many are discussing leaving because of the crime well you can do something about that Best weapon against crime is a job with a livable wage. Not, not McGruff, the crime dog. Not Nancy Reagan, just say no. Not even a police on every corner. You fight crime by investing in youth employment. 80% of our black youth are unemployed. 80%. Livable wage. Not $20 a week. They can make $200 a week doing the wrong thing. So we need them to have jobs that will support them 
in a way that they don't feel the desperation to go and steal and rob others. And on that note, everybody seems confused about why we have such a rash and, and brash form of crime now. Well, last year I was with Reverend in the office, Reverend Jackson, so brilliant, analyze it in 30 seconds. I said, Rev, it's troubling me that we have so much crime suddenly. Where did this come from? He said, lawlessness starts at the top. Lawlessness stop, starts at the top. 2020, we saw the most lawless actions in the history of America against a sitting government that's not at civil war with itself. You try and overthrow the government. These young people hear and see thousands of people climbing the walls of Congress, attempting to kidnap Congress folks. And then you think you can tell these young folks who are desperate, living in poverty, you failed to educate them. You think they're going to listen to you? And then you give them Gator. The 20% crime went up, and nearly 20% of gun purchasing went up. You dump guns. You help. You let China bring in the fentanyl through Mexico. You remove the jobs from Inglewood and Lawndale. Replace them with those guns and drugs for them to kill themselves with. And then those left standing, you subject them to a criminal justice system that seeks to make money off the backs of the misery that they've allowed to fester. And you think they're going to look at that and say, well, the president is encouraging a riot? And they're kicking down the doors of Congress? and climbing over the walls, got AR-15s, same guns they're criticizing us about. And you think they're going to say, mm, mm, mm. I'm just going to dwell in poverty. I'm going to reject these guns and these drugs that I use to escape the conditions that I'm in. And I'm just going to say, those are bad people. No, comes from the top. And the best way to fight crime, my corporate leaders, is a livable wage. And let me say this, I'm not sure it's crime that has these leaders talking like this. Or is it an excuse to leave town for greener and cheaper pastures? Oh, I've seen this before. I've seen this movie before. I grew up watching this movie. Detroit had the largest middle class in America. In 1980s, we had 1.2 million people. Then the corporations. Black mayor elected, white flight, corporations, of course it's white flight, taxpayers take the money out of town, you're going to have some unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. Corporations, auto industry, in 30 years lay off 30, 300,000 people, family of three, that's 900,000 citizens. Detroit is now has 720,000 people because the people followed the jobs. And you know where those jobs went? They went to Mexico. 
They went to Canada. They went down south to avoid the unions and to get a lower cost of living. We understand how that goes. And what happened to Detroit, I don't even have to tell you. You don't want that to happen to Chicago, do you? And part of it is the media pointing only at that. Why can't the media just show? I know we need to know what's going on. Why can't you put it in print? Why you got to sensationalize crime and, 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 and scare the folks? Showing riots on television, showing some crazy Negro with his hair all looking like he cracked out, talking crazy. That's what images you put up. And you think the people are not going to get scared and say they want to skip town. Chicago crime has went down, folks. Murder rate has went down. And so this crime game we're hearing, they can stop that. Find another reason. And if it's taxes that you're so concerned about, I saw one of them looked up. Somebody checked up. They were looking at their phone. And when I said taxes, he looked right up. Well, let me tell you about that. Why does the government use taxes? The government uses taxes to provide for its citizens. And when the citizens are not being served enough by the federal government. Federal government said, we need more for Medicare. We need more to pay off this, to pay off that. And some of these corporations, they have skipped the country because of that. But do we want that, corporate leaders? Do you want this to be Detroit with corporate abandonment? And when you return to visit, the people that help you build your company, you built your companies on the backs of Chicagoans, made these super profits. Now you want to run? Is that ethical to you? And I know, well, we got to answer the star. We have to answer to our stockbrokers. We have to answer to our stockholders and such and such. Okay, fine. I'm going to be at that next stock meeting. I'm going to buy some stock, and I'm going to be right there, and I'm going to appeal to their ethics. Reverend Jackson taught us that. We buy stock in the corporation so we can go to the stockholders' meetings and let our voice be heard. NAACP followed up. One big incident they had with a major corporation based here. They sent out a warning to our, a notice to, an advisory rather, to our members throughout the country. Stock price went down 2% next day. If we want to play that game, but we want to threat, if we want to keep threatening, we got some threats of our own. We got some threats that the mayor cannot get involved in, but folks like me who's not scared can. I'm not scared to talk and I'm not scared to act. You can't do nothing to me. I ain't run you off TV too late. I got your money. <laughs> You've been tricked. I know you thought you had just somebody you could control. As I leave, They're about to run me out of here. <laughs> As we face this critical election year, we need to hear more about the things that our community, on King Day, what's being done, and what are the goals, and what are the achievements for our community, not just black faces in high places. We love all the African American Supreme Court sisters or our sister in the Supreme Court and all the other cabinet members. We love them all. But what about the masses of our folks? Recent polls by black folks 
so that we care most about racial justice, economic opportunity, policing, voting rights, and education reform. Not war in the Middle East, not funding for Ukraine, not abortion rights, not even immigration. Don't even come in the top five, none of those in black folks' concerns. Not one of those are within the top five. So you got to talk to us about that. You have to talk to us about economic justice, which is Dr. King's last efforts, Reverend Jackson will tell you. We won that struggle. We won the struggle for civil rights, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act. T Civil Rights Act turned economics around 360%. Prior to the Civil Rights Act, you had 80%, 75% of our people lived in poverty, 25% middle class or working class. Now it's 360% turned around. 75% of our folks, middle class, upper income, only 25% in poverty, a 360 degree turn. It worked. Voting Rights Act after that, 1965. At that time, we had less than 1,000 black elected officials. Now we have over 20,000 black elected officials and we won the presidency. And so it is that this struggle for economic justice must continue because we're winning there too. Don't let anybody tell you any different. Civil Rights Act allowed us in the mainstream of America. Now we have hundreds of thousands of black professionals. We have over two million black millionaires. So stop begging other folks to do what we want to do for ourselves. I'm gonna leave that alone for now. There's some of y'all black millionaires in here today. I don't wanna embarrass you. But we've won in many ways, and now we must fight for income equality, Dr. King would want us to continue to do, access to capital, to building our own businesses, as Dr. King would suggest. And then, reparations. They've eliminated affirmative action, don't want to give us a hand up at all after keeping us down. So we're going to go for the whole thing. We tried to be nice and accept affirmative action, diversity, equity, inclusion. We tried to go for all of the little stuff and you took it back. Well, now we're coming for it all. We're coming for it all. You project to spend $600 billion in the next six years on the migrant crisis. 600 billion. All we need is 300 billion for 30 years, and you'll pay the debt that you owe African Americans here in America. Thank you all for listening. God bless you. Thank you, Judge Mathis, for those moving remarks, and I will be sure to tell my sister in media, Cheryl Burton, you said hello. I am now pleased to welcome back to the stage Mayor Brandon Johnson for final remarks. Wow, so I had a speech, but I'm just going to leave that on the, on the table. <laughs> Come on, y'all, make, make our, our brother um, feel good. Judge Mathis, thank you for your moral clarity. I'd be remiss if I did not, you know, thank, you know, the fine workers that are here today that are protected by Unite Here. So thank you to all of the workers that are here today. And to um, all of my colleagues, the vice mayor was here, uh, and all of the city council members that are here. Cook County Board President Tony Prankwinkle uh, was here. Let's acknowledge her and thank her for her leadership. Uh, our state's attorney, Kim Fox, Kwame Ra Raul, our attorney general, our secretary of state, um, Alexi Janulius uh, was, was here as well. It's all of our uh, county commissioners and 
our state reps and state senators, all of our business leaders, our community organizations. I'm grateful for the labor leaders that are here, Bob Ryder, CFL. Of course, you all know Greg Kelly, the finest, the finest, the finest looking labor leader in the history of the world. Thank you. Yeah, got the vice mayor wearing ascots now to try to look like Greg Kelly. Stacey Davis Gates, president of Chicago Teachers Union. Thank you for your leadership. My pastor emeritus is here, Coach Wayne Gordon, thank you, and Ann for your leadership, and of course my new pastors, uh, the Brooks, thank you so much to my Lawndale community, and of course I'm not here today um, in this position without the, the leadership of, of Reverend Jackson. Thank you so much, man. You're so smooth and so courageous. You know, Reverend Jackson said to me some time ago when he first met me when I was organizing, he said, if you ever just find a barber, you might become mayor of Chicago one day. So, and now I get two haircuts a week, Reverend. Thank you very much. <laughs> the first black first lady in the history of the world, you all. Stacy Nicole Rencher Johnson, I love you. Thank you. We were getting up this morning and the snow was coming down. And my wife, in the true Chicago fashion, just started putting out boots and coats and stuff. It never even dawned on her that the kids would be home. This is Chicago, you all. We don't take days off. We just get stronger. Congratulations to you all. Um, but really, uh, thank you, Val, for your, for your efforts and your leadership and to the entire staff, the city of Chicago, that made this event remarkable. I'll just close with this. You know, there's so much to be said about this particular moment that we're in right now. But I'm so grateful that we have, have had a prophetic voice and Dr. Keene, who not just saw this moment coming, but he also saw the solution for the moment that was coming. You know, it's one thing to dream of, of, of possibilities. It's another thing when you are committed to administering the very solutions that can transform not just black America, but that can transform the world. And all the faith leaders that are here today, the interfaith effort, to bring Chicago together, to build a better, stronger, safer Chicago. It's not just possible, but it's happening. And here's how it happened for me. So there was a West Side teacher by the name of Al Raby who was leading this city in a variety of ways. And he invited Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to the city of Chicago to confront the crisis of housing. And with that invitation, when Dr. King showed up in the city of Chicago, he saw the challenges, but he saw the possibilities, and he had a very prophetic, strong pronouncement. And he said, if we can figure it out in Chicago, we can do it anywhere in the world. In the very room that I now occupy, I think it's just prophetic, but it's also divine, that a high school history teacher invited one of the greatest humanitarians to ever walk the planet Earth to the fifth floor, and now the fifth floor is occupied by a high school teacher raising a family on the west side of Chicago. As Gator Bradley would say, you better listen. <laughs> and so the very elevators that I would block and took an arrest at City Hall, those elevators are now opened up to grassroots organizations that have been kept out of government for ages. That the election of this last year on the very day that Dr. King was assassinated. If anybody is doubting who and why I'm here, you don't have to anymore. For those who, of you who are still worried of whether or not we're gonna bring people together, you don't have to worry. You know why? Because it's through the lens of black liberation that all of us exist today. It really is. And so from the bottom of my heart, this first, of the next 23 MLK days that I will celebrate as mayor of the city of Chicago. <laughs> I'm so grateful. And here's what it started out with. You know, we passed paid time off on the greatest, most expansive paid leave ordinances in the entire country. 10 days. We abolished the sub-minimum wage uh, um, practice in this, in this city which has its history in slavery. We passed treatment, not trauma, creating an alternative response to 911. And remember those health clinics that were closed two administrations ago? I'm gonna open up two of them in this year's budget. 
A quarter of a billion dollars my administration has committed to deal with the unhoused. $100 million of investment in violence prevention. We stood up an entire office with the leadership of the Black Caucus, an office for reentry. We reinstituted the Department of the Environment. I can keep going, but the program is over. But what I will say this, my administration isn't. So God bless you all. Happy Keen Day. And God bless the greatest freaking city in the world, the city of Chicago. Thank you so much to Mayor Brandon Johnson. And of course, as we conclude our program, I'd like to everyone to keep standing, please, for the benediction right now. This will be led by Pastor David Marrero of New Life Covenant Church, Humble Park Campus, and all program participants. Right after that, please join in a singing of We Shall Overcome. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the mayor, to all the stakeholders, to those who serve in our city, I want to give you Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we thank you for this special occasion where men and women from walks, all walks of life come together in unity. We thank you for our servant leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who paved the way for us all. Help us, Lord, to carry out his legacy in pursuing unity, peace, and harmony. We pause and lament for those who have been affected by violence, hate, discrimination, injustice. Bring healing to those who have found themselves victims of hate and evil. Jesus, you prayed for your disciples. You prayed that as you are one with the Father, that we will be one with you. We are praying for unity. Unity amongst each other. Unity in our city. As we close our time together, we are prayerful for the city we love, the city we live in, and the city we serve in. We are faced with so many challenges, so I pray for your grace to rest on us and give us your peace. Have mercy on us. And guide us as we work to bring about the change we desire to see. Lord, in the midst of all the opposition we face, we know, God, that you are still sovereign. And our faith and trust is in you. We pray for our mayor. Give him your wisdom and your grace to lead. Direct his path and may his soul find rest in your presence. I pray for a hedge of protection over his body, mind, and soul. Let that hedge be extended to his wife and his children. Turn your face upon them and bless them. I close with Ephesians 4, 3. Make every effort to preserve the unity the Spirit has already created with peace binding you together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. So Thank you so much to every one of you who attended this 38th annual Dr. Martin Luther King breakfast. Have a fantastic, remember, don't forget to do service. And if you want to check the weather, abc7chicago.com. Okay, that part. Enjoy your day. It's too late. Oh, it's too late.
sunny morning of one of the brightest days in Washington's history brings people by the train load, the bus load, the plane load from every part of America to their capital. you a question and that is what is in your life's blueprint number one should be a deep belief in your own dignity your own worth and your own somebodyness I refuse to accept the idea that the isness of man's present nature makes him morally incapable of reaching up for the eternal oughtness that forever confronts him. I refuse to accept the idea that man is mere floatsam and jetsam in the river of life, unable to influence the unfolding events which surround him. Even if Going out in sweet streets like Michelangelo painted his picture. Sweet streets like Handel and Beethoven composed music. Sweet streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweet streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can't be a pine on the top of a hill, be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub on the side of the reel. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. It isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are.